Good, so good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Karel de Smet and I work at Open Minds. I do marketing and sales, so I'm a part of the very small group of uh, non-technical people in here. And therefore, I'm not going to talk about automation or serverless or microservices, but I'm going to talk about a much more simple concept, and that's uh, honesty. When I was writing the uh, abstract for this presentation, so to come here uh, and give this presentation, I um, thought about an analogy for the old way of selling, and that's the bad way of selling. And the analogy, more specifically, is that of the car salesman. So imagine you're walking into a car dealership, any car dealership, pick a brand you like, and um, you go into the corner to some car you like, and you start walking around it, you inspect it from the outside, you open the car door, um, you have a seat at the driver's seat, and you inspect the inside, take a look at the dashboard, and um, all of a sudden, the car salesman, he notices you, and he comes up to you, and stands beside you and says, well, hello, sir, I see you're inspecting our brand new model. Let me tell you something about it. Um, this model has a 300 brake horsepower engine, a brilliant suspension, uh, an automatic parking system, and he keeps babbling on about all the features and the qualities of this car, and actually what he's saying is, look at me, you know, look at my qualities, look at my features, look at how good I am, buy me. And that's the old way of selling, that's what I mean with that. It's just saying, you know, this is you know, just pointing out everything that's positive, and actually that's not the honest way. But let me give you some more insight into what I mean with it, with this ad from Nordnet, which is a, a Scandinavian bank. So this is what I, what I mean with the old way of selling, you know. Here again, um, Nordnet, of course, makes complete fun uh, out of this, um, just uh, by turning it around. Um, but again, it's just saying, you know, look at how good we are, look at how great everything is going. So that's what I mean with that. And now I'm going to give you five examples of how you can do it the right way. And for the first example, I'm, I'm going to take you back to the car industry. And um, in the 60s, Volkswagen, they had this um, brilliant advertising campaign for the, for the Beetle. And Volkswagen, they were not too, too shy to, and too shabby to admit that the Volkswagen is not the prettiest car. You know, ugly is only skin deep. They were not too shabby to admit that it's not the fastest car, nor were they uh, afraid to admit that, was, that it was never going to be the coolest car. Now, why did they do this? You know, in an era where the classic form of advertising was the old way, just saying, you know, this is the car, this uh, are the features, you know, look at me, buy my car. Why did Volkswagen take this approach? Because if you're in a room full of people shouting, look at me, look at how good I am, you know, these are my qualities, buy me. Then it's refreshing and charming at the same time if there's someone, of, if there's some company or brand who's saying, well, I have some negative points, but hey, I'm here. Maybe 
you might like me. And, you know, this is who I am. As a third point, it's also some kind of reverse play. If I'm saying, um, these are my qualities, my features, look at how great everything is going, then the modern consumer thinks, well, there must be something wrong with it. So Volkswagen turned it around and they said, well, we're not the prettiest, we're not the fastest. And then in your mind, okay, I accept that, then all the rest should probably be fine. That's why Volkswagen took this approach to the advertising. Now, the second example, um, I'm gonna take you to another industry infamous for the old way of advertising, and that's the travel industry. Um, any Dutch people in the room? Yes? Um, well, maybe other people will know the Hans Brinker Budget Hotel. Does that ring a bell to someone? No? Yes, in the back? The Hans Brinker Budget Hotel. Well, I don't uh, usually know where to start. Um, it's brilliant advertising. If you have some spare time, just go over to their website. Um, they have a lot of uh, you know, very funny um, ads or, or just communication. Um, one of their slogans is, uh, the hotel that couldn't care less, but we will try. And <laughs> believe me, they do everything uh, to make that true. Um, on their website, uh, one of their other slogans is, more honesty, less of everything else. Uh, perfectly displayed by the guy uh, sleeping in his locker. Um, they have uh, infamous check-in, check-out pictures. Uh, <laughs> these leave no room for interpretation as to your state uh, when you will leave the hotel or leave Amsterdam. Um, they have them male, female, doesn't matter to them. Uh, you have lots of them. They're also sorry for being excellent in losing your luggage and sorry for being wonderful at not welcoming you. They also have a very uh, special ad about their eco-commitment. Um, I hope it's going to start right about now. Yes, perfect. So, again, same question as with Volkswagen. 
why do they use this type of advertising in an industry which is famous for hey uh, look at my big swimming pool uh, look at my great facilities and whatnot because the Hans Brinker budget hotel they want to find the right customer they don't want a couple on their honeymoon looking for extreme hygiene um, they want the youngsters who come to Amsterdam for one thing, maybe two things. <laughs> and um, <laughs> this way it's also easier to exceed the expectations. Um, I mean, after looking at this, you're probably thinking, well, if I ever go there, probably my expectations will be very low. Don't have to expect a lot. But when you take a look at the reviews on TripAdvisor and similar websites, um, the Hans Brinker Budget Hotel is actually rated quite good. It's clean, people are friendly. It's not a four-star hotel, but hey, you know, you get a bed and you get to sleep in it, so it's what you paid for. Um, it also has the element of surprise. If now you're ever wanting to go there, you probably don't know what to expect, which makes it kind of exciting. And it works. The Hans Brinker Budget Hotel has a nice bar. It's mainly uh, full, full booked. Um, if you want to get a room, it's available from 2250. Um, it's located close to the Prinsengracht in the center of Amsterdam. And now uh, they even have uh, a hotel in Lisbon. Uh, and they use the same... <laughs> The same kind of advertising. So, uh, like they say, the same uh, dubious service in slightly, slightly better weather. So I, I had uh, two examples of um, basic advertising, but now I'm going to take you to um, a slightly different form of communication, and that's some um, crisis communication, and. For my third example, I'm, I'm taking you to the U.S., to the east coast of the U.S. And um, in, um, on Valentine's Day, Valentine's Day in uh, 2007, a uh, major snowstorm hit uh, the east of the U.S. And um, one of the airways, JetBlue Airways it's called, was hit pretty hard. And they basically had to cancel all their flights for five days in a row. And it hit them harder than all the other airlines because some internal procedures, maybe stuff that's located at other locations, um, you know, uh, agreements with the airports, um, they were hit harder than all the other major airlines. And of course, you have a lot of uh, disgruntled customers when you can't get any flight off the ground for five days in a row. And a week later, the CEO, he sent out an apology. And he said, we know we failed to deliver last week. You deserve better, a lot better. And we let you down. And that was great. I mean, when we got to take a look at the figures, they had $30 million in related costs to the snowstorm. But when you compare the revenue from the second quarter of 2007 compared to the previous year and the second quarter of 2007 as the quarter following Valentine's Day, they had a 19% increase in revenue. And believe me, those figures are better than all their competitors who weren't as much in the media um, with negative attention to start with. And okay, maybe the 19% increase in revenue Maybe 2007 was a slightly better year, but still, you have a 19% revenue increase in a quarter after a major crisis, you've done pretty good. They also drafted a customer bill of rights because a lot of uh, customers uh, wanted to make a, uh, a complaint, a claim, and, you know, gets to court really quickly, and customers aren't really happy about that, so they made very clear and honest communication after that about when or when not you are entitled to a refund or to uh, a free night in a hotel near the airport or anything. 
and customers have been very happy about um, this communication and this very clear, these very clear agreements on when you can lay claim or, or get a refund. So for example, well, it's a bit uh, yesterday, uh, I, I heard there are some people from Rabobank uh, in the audience. Are they here? Please raise your hands. Well, four people, well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, New Year's Eve 2008, uh, does that ring a bell? It does not. <laughs> it does not. <laughs> yes? Maybe, maybe you want to come up and uh, tell it for me. Um, so do, does anybody else, um, besides the people from Rabobank, um, know what I'm going to talk about right now? No? Well. New Year's Eve, 2008, around, uh, well, correct me if I'm wrong at any point, I will be making some slight mistakes probably, as you're the experts. But around um, 11 p.m., so about one hour before uh, everyone starts uh, breaking out the champagne and uh, starts counting down, there is uh, one person um, who decides to, tech, to, to check his uh, account balance. And he sees that uh, Rabobank has deposited uh, his interests, but he received about 10 euros less than he should have gotten. Now, New Year's Eve, 11 p.m., I don't know what you're doing, but I'm certainly not checking my account balance. But apparently there are um, people, so he puts it online on a forum, a uh, forum about banking, about saving. And apparently there are more people in, in uh, New Year's night who are going on their PCs and checking online what their account balance is. And around 4 p.m. it's the ball starts to roll and there are already um, a dozen of reactions about, yeah, I did not get enough money from Rabobank and people are starting to get worried. Um, they're calling them crooks. Uh, calling them criminals, as you would normally do to banks, nothing special really. Um, and around 10 p.m., well, it, it really is starting to explode right now. Um, there are already like 20 reactions, about 10 of them uh, are people who are saying, yes, I, I did not get enough money. Um, everybody uh, continues to call Rabobank crooks. And uh, around... Um, this time, probably, a Rabobank spokesperson probably wakes up, goes downstairs, has lunch with his wife, and opens up his laptop, and for some reason, he must have noticed that there was something going on with Rabobank on the internet. And um, he sees it on the forum, he sees all the reactions, and he says, well, we're going to look into it, or we're looking into it. If there was a mistake, then we will correct it as soon as possible. And now there's a, a storm of positive reactions. You know, everybody is giving praise to the, Rabo the, the Rabobank spokesperson for being honest, for reacting at, you know, this is New Year's Day, um, 11 a.m. That's, I mean, again, I don't know what you're doing at 11 a.m., but I'm not awake, so... Um, it gets a lot of praise, people are starting to correct each other, they see reactions on social media um, from people who say, well, I haven't gotten enough interest, and they're saying, well, the problem is already solved, why didn't you see this? There's already a Rabobank spokesperson who told us what the problem is, and they'll correct it as soon as possible. And the only reason why nobody knows the story is just because the Rabobank spokesperson was quick and honest, to react, just said, well, listen, I'm going to be honest, I don't know about it because it was definitely a technical error. I mean, can't imagine he's responsible for giving everybody his money. So um, we just reacted and said, we'll look into it and we'll correct it uh, as soon as possible. Now for the fifth um, and last example, um, I'm going to take the, the honesty again to another level. and. Let me ask you, does, does anyone know who this man is? Because I'm definitely going to give you a, a huge uh, shout out. 
No? This is Tony Shea. And Tony Shea is the CEO of uh, Zappos, which is like the uh, Zalando in America. So they're basically an on online retailer for shoes and clothes. And I'm just going to show you a, a quick film about uh, Zappos. So the reason why I'm uh, I'm showing you this uh, this film, well, basically there are two reasons. And if if Zappos was an IT company, they they'd be a DevOps company, you know, going outside um, to other departments, learning to work with them, um, just honest communication. It's about collaboration, about a a really nice culture, um, a place where you're feeling comfortable to work in. And um, well, this is a picture of the Zappos head office in Las Vegas. Looks more like it's been carnival there yesterday. Um, and Zappos, they want to employ uh, and, and deliver wow. You know, that's, that's the second thing um, why I showed you this film. Um, because they really want to give um, an incredible customer experience um, and um, at the same time, um, a very open and honest relationship. And they took that honesty to another level. Because in the retail industry, um, it's very common to treat your um, vendors like the enemy. You don't want to give them anything. You just want to buy from them. Or you just want to know what the price is to buy 100,000 units. And then you want to tell them to bug off and leave me alone. Just deliver it to me. And then, you know, that's the basic kind of relationship that in the retail industry everybody has with their vendor. But Zappos, they, because of the culture, um, they wanted to open everything up. They wanted to be honest with their vendors. So they gave them insights into their sales. They gave them insights into their marketing. 
Um, like for example, when it's New Year, there's a higher demand, so perhaps um, the vendor can um, anticipate that by having a bigger production in the months before that. Um, they also have very clear rules um, what uh, you know the, the the relationship should be like, um, both for them and for the vendors. And so they, they took it up, they um, took it to a whole new level. They have this um, portal for vendors where they can check everything. Um, this is a whole new level of, con uh, of honesty. Um, now, why am I booming out of, or booming on about this, this honesty? Because it's all about understanding others you know and i feel that devops is that way too it's about understanding it's about collaborating and communicating about building bridges and working towards the same goal and all these things they imply honesty you know if there's no honesty that's never going to work and i heard um, terry from google yesterday say um well when you come back from devops days and you have this idea and um, you want to implement it and you want to drive that change, the least thing you have to do is be honest to your boss or your colleague because if you're not going to do that, then it's never going to work. And so that's, that's what I feel DevOps is about because I'm not, like I said, the technical person in the room. Um, so it's about communication, collaboration and integration and all these things, you need honesty for them. Just remember that. So thank you. Uh, if there are any questions, please feel free to ask. And uh, well, have a good day here. Questions? One question. OK, the mic won't reach there. So if you can come up here. Hi. Um, so in the two examples that you present about the cars, uh, you uh, present like the people saying the car is always presenting themselves as either one way is great, and the other way is like, this is where I am. Um, in terms of uh, what you're presenting, how do you put it when you actually talk about the needs of the customer? Like you first start talking about why do you need a car? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that how, how do you approach that in, in all the things that you... Well, that's also, I mean, that also implies a certain level of honesty. Um, I wrote the abstract, and I think uh, in there I wrote something about, um, well, we do hosting. And uh, if a customer comes to us and he says, well, I would like to host, then, yeah, I could sell him a cloud server with 64 gigabytes of RAM, but he might do it on shared hosting. Um, so we're trying to assess the needs of the customer first. Um, that's also a form of honesty. And if a customer comes to us and he says, well, I want this or that, then, you know, we might say, well, we're not the best suited party to come to. Maybe it's better if, you know, you try and search somewhere else um, for a better suited party. So, you know, identifying the needs of your customer implies a certain level of honesty. So, does that answer to your question? More questions? Okay, so we're running early today. 